seated. I'd ask if you were, as you were seated, to take out your Bible and also to take out the sermon outline that you have. These men are here in the front to give one to you. If you don't have one, please lift your hand. Everyone needs one. The way that we study the Bible, this will be very helpful to you, especially because of the long passage that we have this morning. This is a long passage, but it won't be a very long sermon. Some of you said, yeah, I've heard that before. Um, but um, I'm reminded that Psalm 23 is perhaps one of the most beloved passages of Scripture in all of the Bible. It's very interesting that around the world, in Western culture anyway, um, whether it be in Europe or in America, you will often hear people quote, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. And they will go through Psalm 23. In fact, re- people who are not religious, people who really are even godless in many cases, whether at a funeral or at a time of, of great concern, um, Psalm 23 bubbles to the top. Now, there's also a song that often bubbles to the top in American culture. Um, almost at every major event or certainly every funeral, what song is often sung? Amazing Grace, very similar. And, you know, Psalm 23 is a song. Psalm uh, Amazing Grace is a song. Um, But this morning we come to the embodiment of Psalm 23. This morning we come to see the revealing of who is this shepherd, so David would write as a shepherd, and it's very interesting, when we, when we, when we look at the subject of shepherding, it, it begins even as early as Pastor Lucas and I were talking about this morning, or, or this week, that it begins as early as Genesis chapter 4 with Abel, Abel offering a sacrifice to the Lord as a shepherd, and in fact, suffering for the sacrifice that he offered. Cain kills Abel for a superior sacrifice, for this picture of the accepted sacrifice of Abel. And you follow that line all the way through the Old Testament and then all the way into the New Testament, we begin to see that this idea of a good shepherd, a true shepherd, is incredibly powerful as it comes all through Scripture. I want us to see the background, and so we're going to skip down there below the box first, and I want us to see the background and the setting of today's message. The first one is this. Our church, Sheridan Hills, has been carefully studying, fill this in, falsehood versus truth on a continual basis. In fact, not only have we been doing that, but we will continue to do that. That is exactly what the Lord Jesus did when he showed up preaching. That is exactly what the prophets did before him. And that is exactly what Moses did before him. That we see this this in a fallen world that there is falsehood and all because there is a deceiver. There is a father of lies. There is this great powerful, horrible force of Satan that God has ordained in this titanic struggle. And and we see that it's not a struggle that that we're worried of who's going to win, but we do see that there is a massive pressure through a fallen world upon the truth. But the truth, as it is declared, reveals the glory of God and brings people to God. And so we see that it is important for a church to continually point out falsehood and point to truth. In fact, we have four key words in the life of our church. We have four words that we say this embodies our values. And uh, the first one that we mention is truth. Everything rises and falls on truth. The second one is worship. The third one is, can anybody help me? Truth, worship, community, a few of you. This is very weak. I can tell what we need to do next Sunday. Okay. Truth, worship, community, and very good, and mission. And it's not missions with an S. 
It is the mission of Christ. It's not merely trips. It's not merely sending a few missionaries. It's that we are all involved in the grand, great commission of God. And so, but all of this begins on knowing the truth. We have to know the truth in a fallen world of much deception. So, we've studied, and I have a, underneath this, the parentheses you see there. For three years, we studied the book of John. Talk about walking in the truth. We, we see this, this great call to walk in the truth. We circle back to that study even today. And then the, the little book of Jude, just very, very powerful um, warning and a powerful proclamation of the truth. The book of James, that we are called not to be self-deceived, but to walk in the truth. We studied marriage in this present day and time. That's something that we need to continually study because the world rejects the plan of God in marriage, the beautiful picture of His love for us played out in earthly roles. Not only that, but worldviews. We looked at the truth versus the falsehoods in various worldviews around us. Hosea, we see the nation of Israel running in falsehood, and we see God calling them back to Himself through Hosea, declaring the truth of their sin and the truth of His grace. And then on Wednesday nights, we've been studying the cults and counterfeit gospels of secret church. And even most recently, in these last few weeks, the American gospel. If you've missed this film, I want to encourage you to come this Wednesday night. Do not miss it. It is showing many of the falsehoods that are all around us and saying, what is the true gospel? What is the truth of Christ? And so, we are a church that is committed to this, and we will see this great Um, division between truth and error even this morning as we study this passage. Number two, last Sunday we looked at Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 20, and we, we were just reminded again of the glorious centrality of Christ, the glorious centrality of Christ not only in the church, but also in our personal lives, and how God is called us to recognize that everything rises and falls on Christ. What you do with Christ determines everything else about your eternal destiny, and not only your eternal destiny, but your success in this life before a holy God. Look at number three. Now, in John, this, is, this is a setup for John chapter 10. What we're about to read is in John chapter 10. But in John chapter 9, it's important for you to know what happens because they are, they are totally related. In fact, you could have not had the chapter division that is there. In John chapter 9, everybody look at number 3 here. In John chapter 9, Jesus healed a man who was born blind. A, gro- a group of Pharisees reacted violently to Jesus' words and his works. And this is interesting. While the blind man was gaining sight, the Pharisees were, underline it, falling into deeper darkness. So, one man is coming to see and even is going to confess Christ and worship him. And the others who see the miracle before their very eyes, having known this blind man perhaps all of their lives, because he was blind from birth, some of them would have known him very well. And they see that he sees, and yet they still reject. Notice the last part of this. The apex of the whole story in in John chapter 9 is in verse 38, when the former blind man worships Jesus. He recognizes Jesus in this. Well, then we come to chapter 10. And this is where we'll spend a few minutes this morning. In chapter 10, it is a continuation of the same conversation between Jesus and the Pharisees. Jesus vividly illustrates the vast difference between himself and the religious establishment of the earth. And so, Jesus as he is revealing himself through his teaching and through his works, he is showing the religious establishment and all of the people there, not only the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and the the religious establishment on the higher levels, but also all the way down into the grassroots of the average person, he is showing them that they may be very, very religious and they may be very much in tune with one another, but they're not in tune with God. 
And this is a, a great warning to us, even here at Sheridan Hills, for those of us that have been here a very long time, for those of us who have been very involved in ministry with it, we, we want to continue to look and to see that there is a distinct difference between religiosity and the true Christ and knowing God truly. And so he gives this metaphor. Jesus gives a metaphor or an analogy, depending on how you define those and how you even view this, but that there's this analogy, this metaphor that is based upon the care of sheep. Once again, this theme that keeps coming up in the Bible, put out there to the side, Genesis 4, Abel. I mean, that, that, that's where we first see this coming along. And then we, we go through Abraham, we go through Moses, we go through David, we go, we go through various of the prophets that, that speak over and over again. We go to Ezekiel and we see that this idea of shepherding keeps coming up and the, the righteous shepherd versus the false shepherds that mislead and do not care. And so here in this passage, we see that there's a thief and a robber. And who is that except specifically here in the context of this conversation, it's the religionists. It's those who are promoting a religion that is without God, that is filled with man. It is filled with self. It is filled with self-righteousness as opposed to Christ-righteousness. And so there is the thief and the robber, but then there's also, second bullet point there is, there is also the true shepherd, and this is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who would be God in the flesh and who would come to give up his life for his people. Now, in order to best to understand this, I want us to look at two types of sheep pens, and um, and this is going to, you say, why are we talking about sheep pens and what, what in the world? And by the way, it is P-E-N-S, thank you. It is not P-I-N on your outline. I think it says P-I-N. That's like to poke you. Um, a pen is something to corral something. So, um, but the collective village pen, and so this is the idea that there would be a village and people would bring, the shepherds would bring their sheep in from out in the wilderness, out off to the sides, and perhaps a walled city, perhaps not a walled city, but they would, they would bring their sheep in together and they would have a collective pen um, very often. There, there might not be separation of them and they would put all their sheep together for the night or maybe it's for a um, a festival that's coming up, as in one of the high holy days, or something where they're not going to be out in the fields. It's, it's, it's a various type of a holiday or a holy day that they're coming together, and they would hold their sheep together out of the fields. Maybe it's wintertime and it's cold, and, and being out in the field, they, they're fed up. What we mean by that is they're full of, of their eating, and they can come in and be there for a couple of days together. And so, that, notice this on your outline, that several flocks would be kept together in the pen, and the doorkeeper would watch over them. So, they would hire one somebody to be there at the door all night long, and maybe they would switch off, but there would be a doorkeeper that would hold them and, and, and watch over the door until the various shepherds would come in the morning to call their flock out. Now, what's so amazing about this, and Marcy and I have lived in North Africa where there's lots of sheep. We have friends that have sheep. We have friends that are shepherds. In fact, some of the pastors that are in North Africa are shepherds or used to be shepherds. Um, and it's very interesting that they, they would keep sheep, and here they are also leading over a church um, because the, the word pastor is the word shepherd. And so we would see and hear as they would bring their flocks out, so interesting what sheep can do. The shepherd that watches over the sheep on a regular basis will go stand at one side, another shepherd will go stand at another side, another shepherd will go the other direction, another shepherd will go the other direction, and within a few feet, they will sit there and stand off from one another, and each one of them will begin saying essentially the exact same thing. They're going, yep, 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 yalla, yalla means come. Yep. Yalla. Yalla. And all four of those men or six of those men can be doing that. And it's amazing that their sheep know who to go to. And they can do it in the dark. They can do it in the light. As they begin to call, they know. 
The other amazing thing is, is that those shepherds know if one of them comes that's not supposed to come. They look at the sheep. Now, I have lots of pictures of sheep, and I'm not showing you this morning, but let me tell you that all sheep look the same to me. (laughs) I've never seen, I mean, you know, they're, they're just, especially if they're of the same species, the same variety. And so, but a shepherd will go, nope, not that one. You get, you know, and he'll go get his crook and he'll go pull him out and turn him around and aim him in the other direction. And the other guy will begin calling and that sheep will run to the other side. It's truly amazing. We, we, our daughter is in from California, so we went to uh, SeaWorld for a few blazingly hot hours this week. And um, oh, 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 true grace and fatherhood right there. But anyways, <laughs> so she and her husband are here, and so we, we go to, we go to uh, SeaWorld, and there's this big tank of dolphins. And the, the lady's standing there, and she's going, oh, yeah, this one's Samuel, and this one's Betty, and this one's whatever, and this one's whatever. I'm like, you don't know that. They're all the same, you know? And she goes, oh, no, they're very different. And they can just look at the dolphins, and they know that these are, that these are they can, you know, it's, it's just amazing how the caretaker can see that and know them very well, what to the untrained eye looks very different. So as this, as this collective village pen is there, there's very, very similar, but out in the countryside, when they're not near the village, they will have other pens, and these are all over Israel, these are all over North Africa, these are all over many places of the world, including Ireland and Scotland and England, uh, where there's sheep, all over uh, New Zealand, you will see countryside field pens as well. And notice this, it's a rudimentary hedge of rocks with one opening, the shepherd would sleep in the doorway to keep the sheep in and the wolves out. This is part of that picture when they're out in the countryside, when there's a little bit more of a danger of other animals coming in, the shepherd stays in the gateway. I I just want you to see a couple of pictures of this so you really imagine this as we read it, and I believe it'll help the passage come alive. Um, There's all kinds of different ones that you see here, some very large, some that would be very small. Um, using the rocks that are nearby, perhaps, usually with one gateway, just one. And in this drawing that is here, you see a shepherd in the doorway. And that would be typically um, what you would see when we are talking about this passage. Now, let's go and let's read the passage, and let's see if it doesn't make a lot of sense as we look at Jesus saying, I am the door and the good shepherd. Notice the box on the page there, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Now, remember, Jesus is comparing himself to the religious establishment. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens... The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 4, when he has brought all of his own, he brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, and they know his voice. Verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Verse 7, so, because they didn't understand, Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. Can you underline that? I am the door. In fact, circle those four words, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. Circle the next phrase, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Verse 12, he who is hired, 
who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves, leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. See, he's just getting paid. It's just what he gets is all his interest is. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd. So Jesus repeats it again. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up. This charge I have received from my Father. Now look at the response in verse 19, 20, 21. There was again a division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Verse 21, others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's study this very quickly. I want us to see a few things that go right in our present day and go right in our own studies as a church right in the great heart of what we need. Number one, we need to recognize the reality of religionists or false teachers. They have been practically from the beginning of time. They have harassed in a fallen world the people of God. There have been false leaders. There have been false prophets. There have been demon-possessed people that have sought to distract and dissuade and destroy the people of God, the truth of God, the way of God. There have been those who rage against from all through antiquity to the present age. There are religionists of many different kinds who have raged against God and against His truth. Number one, in verse one, notice what it says. He says, truly, truly, I say, look at the screen in front of you. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheep hold by the door, but climbs in by another way, read it out loud to me. What does it say? That man is a thief and a robber. Now, some would say Jesus is saying here, the way that is the proper way through the door is the way that has been prophesied from the beginning of time. That from the fall, we saw that God was going to have a great antidote to sin. From the very beginning, it is described that one is going to come that is going to bruise the head of the deceiving serpent. And through this woman is going to come one who is going to come and overcome this great peril of sin, this great tragedy of sin. And so we see all the way through, there is this picture of the prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that is going to come. And when we get to the birth of Jesus, at that point, the prophecies have described what town he's going to be born in, what his parents are going to be like. It's going to describe what he's going to, how he's going to be conceived, the fact of how he's going to live. I mean, over and over and over again, we see very specific prophecies, and this is the door of prophecy. This is the door, that this is the proper one that's coming through the proper door. He's not climbing over a wall for himself. That's part of the picture that we may see here in John chapter 10 in verse 1, that he is not the selfish one. But here we see that they are thieves and robbers. Look at the next one in verse 10. And I want you to see verse 10. Look at the screen in front of you. So in John 10, 10, it says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. So fill this in. They do not take care of the flock. They don't come to take care of the flock. 
In fact, it would be good for you this evening before you go to bed to go read Ezekiel chapter 34, and it's one of the places in the Old Testament where we see the comparison between the good shepherd of God and the false shepherds that will come and seek to destroy and undermine the work of God in the world that are maybe even religious people. And so they do not come to take care of the flock. In fact, they feed themselves on the sheep. And here we see a very different picture. Look at the next part. In verse 12, and this is on the screen in front of you as well, he is a hired hand and not a shepherd. So he's, he's really just a hired hand. This isn't his profession. He doesn't really care. He does not own the sheep. He sees the wolf coming and he leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And so we see here that they are cowards and they abandon the flock. As soon as something that's a threat to them comes, they take off. They do not stand in the way, holding on to the truth. In Matthew chapter 23 and verse 4, and this is out to the side of your, of your point here, they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders. That's what Jesus would say. You see, they are harsh. They are hypocrites, and they are harsh. And then in nine, chapter 9 in verse 36 of Matthew, we see, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, for they were harassed and helpless. Can you underline those two words? Harassed and helpless. When Jesus looked at the multitudes, he said, look at them. They're harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It's very interesting that sheep just don't survive on their own. They have to be protected. They have to be cared for. Throughout thousands and thousands of years, you, you let a herd of sheep go, and they're on their own in their wilderness, and in just a little while, they're either, they, they've either thirst to death or they have starved to death, they, they not, are not even smart enough to move from one field to the next. They will eat the field all the way down to the ground and kill the grass. She, the, 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 the sheep have to be led. And so this is, this is part of the picture here that these guys, they do not protect and lead the flock. They are only there to get what they want. In contrast to the reality of the religionists, we see in these verses the reality of Jesus. And he is the door. He is the good shepherd. What's interesting about this is that there are six I am statements. Uh, there's actually more than that, but six specific metaphors in the book of John. Um, and, it, and it all comes off of I am the I am where God is saying this, I am the ultimate one. I am the sovereign ruler of the universe. And the same phraseology is used, the same words are used before each one of these metaphors. And here we see two of them. He says, I am the door and I am the good shepherd. So I am the port through which you come. And it's by this way and only this way. You see, in verse 3 and 14, I want you to see this. Look at the screen. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And then look at verse 14, also on the screen. I am the good shepherd. Look what it says. I know my own, and my own know me. So fill this in. He knows his sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep. Not only does he know his sheep, but in John chapter 10 and verse 9, it says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, fill this one in. He cares for his sheep. So he knows his sheep and he cares for them. He takes them in and out of the safety of the pen and out to the, to the right pastures. And he brings them out. He leads them out into the right pastures where they find good pasture. And then in verse 15, we see another. Look what it says on the screen. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and this is amazing, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Now, just look at that verse for a second. This is what is so strange. Usually, 
people would say, well, it's the sheep who are consumed. It's the shepherd who eventually, you know, they may shear the sheep in order to benefit from their wool, but eventually the sheep lays down his life for the shepherd in one sense. And here we see this very, very strange statement that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And so you see, this, this goes right along the tip, with the typical way that God moves in the world and God works on the economy of God instead of the economy of man. What we begin to see is that God is saying, what you think is the norm, I say very, very often, it is just the opposite of what you think. Over and over and over again, we see that the conventional wisdom of the world is indeed a fallen wisdom, and it is not the truth of God. Here is where we see the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He protects and saves the sheep. This is what he does. He lays down his life for his sheep. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, we see it so very clearly. And in fact, I'd like to ask you to let, just write out there to the side of 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24, the substitutionary atonement. I know those are two big words, but important words for you, the substitutionary atonement. This is where Christ becomes your substitute. The death that you should have died, taking on the wrath of God. Christ takes for us. We see this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Look what it says, and let's read it out loud together. It's right there on your outline. Let's read it aloud, out, to, out loud together. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So Peter is making clear to the early church, the only hope that you have is that Jesus went to the cross and died in your place. He himself bore our sins in his body. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. Here again, we see very similarly in the next chapter, for Christ also suffered once for sins. Underline this. The righteous for the unrighteous. Now, you see, once again, that doesn't make sense to the fallen human mind. That doesn't make sense to us. Why would the righteous go and pay for the unrighteous? It should be the unrighteous paying for the righteous. But that also doesn't work in the economy of God. Look what it says. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. So this is what happens when we look to Christ and we look to what He has come for, that He has laid down His life for His sheep. But not only has He laid His life down, look at uh, John chapter 10 and verse 17. Look at the screen in front of you for a little bit easier uh, so you're not flipping back and forth. Look at the screen. It says, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. You see, we, we, we don't need to be under this idea that, that Judas betrayed Jesus and the religious leaders came with the Roman soldiers, and everything went south, and I mean, God was in heaven going, what am I going to do now? That wasn't the plan at all. You see, God was in the garden that evening, in the garden of Gethsemane, laying down his life for his sheep. Verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So Father, Son, and Spirit working perfectly in unison. The Son obeying the command of the Father to go in this beautiful picture of the Son willingly submitting to the Father. And we see this in the unified God plan of our salvation that we are going to see this glorious sacrifice of a perfect and holy God laying down his life 
to save us. So this is why we would say this is only of God. He takes up his life. And who can take up his life again? Only God. The only the one who speaks and from his words comes life. So the glorious picture of not only the reality of Jesus being the door and the good shepherd, but here we see also, number three, a lot about the reality of true Christians or the people who are truly God's people as opposed to people who are self-deceived. This is Christ's flock. These are Christ's sheep. And in verse 9, we see it, and it's below the, the point that is here. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. You see, true Christians go through the door, and true Christians go through the door of Christ. They're not trying to climb around another way. They're not staying outside the, the door. They're going in with the shepherd. And here's the picture. I mean, what you, you say, well, what are other ways in which this would happen? Well, you can put out there to the side good works, self-righteousness, or maybe someone who thinks that they're going to get into the flock of God by their pedigree, by who they are, who their father was, who their mother was, who their grandfather was, who their grandmother was. I, I can tell you as a pastor, when, very often when people meet me on the street or whatever, and we're just kind of talking, they say, well, what do you do for a living? And I say, well, I'm, I'm a pastor. And they will very often, immediately, they'll say, oh, well, my uncle's a pastor. Or, oh, well, my dad was a pastor. Or my grandfather was a pastor. And immediately, there's a lot of folks who, maybe, maybe it's obvious that they're not living for God. Maybe it's obvious that in whatever circumstance it is, that they immediately, though, run to this idea of somewhere in my family and somewhere in my heritage, there is something that is going to have some saving grace upon me. I just want to say to you that we don't go through the door of a father or a mother or an uncle or a grandmother we go through the door of Christ and only the door of Christ. This is the only hope for our salvation. It doesn't have to do with what you've done and what you've given and where you've been and, and all of the things that, that you've been through in your life and the struggles that you've been through. And it doesn't have to do with your pedigree. It has to do with the door of Christ. John 14 and verse 6 is one of the most key verses that any Christian should know. It says, Jesus is speaking, and he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Read it out loud together with me. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I didn't say that. God said that. The Lord Jesus would say that. And why? Because he is the one laying down his life for his sheep. Not only do they go through the door of Christ, but in verse 3, notice there what it says. The sheep hear his voice, just below the next bullet point, verse 3. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. You see, here's what it is. They hear his voice. True Christians hear the voice of Christ. True Christians listen to the voice of God calling them to, them to himself. I had the privilege yesterday of sitting with two people that have been through Starting Point and just listening to their testimonies, um, actually four people, and one of them just, just told about how it was just so evident that in all of his lostness, in all of his not knowing God, and all of his uh, just confusion from childhood and some of those things, but pursuing his own thing, here he is going to a church that doesn't even preach Christ. But as they were singing in this church that did not preach Christ, they still, they still sung the Lord's Prayer. And it was one day while singing the Lord's Prayer as someone who did not know the gospel, it's as if God just came and descended upon him and caused him to have a holy hunger to know this God. Amen. And he said, I, I was just standing there enjoying being part of a choral group. I had just started developing my voice. I was just enjoying singing. But here, this truth came, and God used that, pulled me out of that circumstance, and eventually led me to where I would hear what this is all about. But God came and called me to himself. What a beautiful picture. See, this is what begins happening. The sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, 
and leads them out. Now, I'm not going to say that this means that you hear an audible voice that shakes the room. Oh, I believe that some probably have, and for whatever reason, some people are harder headed than others. I don't know, but the, the picture is this, that God comes and He draws us to Himself. The Scripture also tells us that unless the Father draws them, we cannot come. And so this is part of the beautiful picture of his divine election that calls us to himself and in his grace and in his mercy. When he doesn't have to save one, he chooses to save many as he calls them, as he says, yip, yip, yalla, yalla. You say, well, I thought he was saying come. Well, that depends on which language, but he is calling us to himself. Look at the next one. We see in verse 16. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. Can you underline that? They will listen to my voice. So it's, it's different than hearing. It's different just, than just simply looking at. We, we see in the context here that it has to do with obedience, that they're going to come and believe, that they're going to come out of their place where they are. And so there's going to be one flock and one shepherd now, you see, part of, the, part of the picture here is that this is talking about those who are not of the nation of Israel. This is talking about not of the Jewish nation. And he's saying these are people that are outside of the Jewish nation, that they too are going to come to know God. Amen. They too are going to come to me. And there's going to be one flock in one shepherd. They obey his voice. And in verse 10, notice what it says in verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. The last one I want you to see here is, is that true Christians experience his abundant life. If we really have come to faith in Jesus, we are going to see and experience the forgiveness that he has the grace that he has, the peace that he has, our life is going to be characterized perhaps through great difficulty and great hardship that he will bring his grace into those hardships. Now, this is where so often the prosperity gospel just completely gets it wrong. You see, the abundant life is not having a Bentley or a jet, or a house on the nicer side of town. The abundant life that Jesus is talking about here is the life of knowing the Creator and being right before the Creator, not because of anything that you've done, but because of everything that He has done. And the abundant life is coming to have peace with the circumstances of a fallen world that God brings His peace. We look at Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your forbearing spirit, your faithful spirit, be known before all men. The Lord is at hand. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all human comprehension, will guard your heart, like a shepherd, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. This is the abundant life. Amen. This is the abundant life that when all of the circumstances and all of the anxieties would be screaming out for you to live in fear and to live distraught, it is saying, no, come and remember that I'm the giver of life and I've made promises that not only have I already made come alive in your life now, in your salvation, but I have made promises that you cannot even imagine that are coming for those who have faith in me. So he has an abundant life, both here, the peace and the grace that he gives, but also especially in the hereafter as we come into his kingdom finally and forever in his glory. So number one, we've seen at the top of the page the reality of the religionists. These are the false teachers that are in it for themselves. They don't care about the sheep. They're simply feeding on the sheep for their own for their own good, for their own joy. Number two, we see the reality of Jesus. He is the door and the good shepherd. His words are, are, are causing great problems around the religionists of his day. They do not understand his words. Some of them want to kill him. Some of them are saying he has a demon, and others are saying, well, wait a minute. We need to think about this. 
Look at what he has said. Look at what he has done. Look at what he's done. Demons don't heal blindness. And so we begin to see that this good shepherd brings good things and salvation and has the power to deliver. And then we see the reality of true Christians, the Christ's flock. As they go through the door, they hear his voice, they obey, and they experience his abundant life. Now, number four, I just want to ask you as we close. There is the reality of our response. And the reality of our response is either rejection of the good shepherd or it is true belief in the good shepherd. Over and over and over again, we see through the gospels and we through, see through the letters of the New Testament that we are called to simply believe upon the shepherd and to believe in what he said and to believe in what he's done. And this is where our relationship with God begins. Now you're packing up, but be careful. Wait just a minute. Think very carefully I have this verse I want you to see. Look at verse 20 and verse 31 that is here on the screen. These are written, this is John 20, 31. These are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that and by believing you may have life. Where? In his name. And what is his name? Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. It is belief in his name, belief in his function. And so we come by believing to know that he is the truth. Now, I want you to notice these two questions that are on the screen in front of you. First one is, so do you believe the good shepherd or do you reject the good shepherd? I call you to believe. Would you stand with me for prayer?